especially his dad. What's his name? Rick. Rick. Hip replacement. How old is he? 68. We'll say a prayer. Uh, Father, we come to you again, Father. And I, and I love the fact that you just love to hear us pray. We just, just love to hear us talk to you. And Lord, we're talking to you tonight about Rick. And uh, Lord, he's, he's going to be having hip replacement surgery, Father. And, and God, I know that, uh, that, that you'll be with him, Lord. But, but I know that the rehab and the, the therapy that's coming after that is going to be really difficult. So just, Lord, be with him. Uh, have your healing hand on him. Give him strength and patience as he, uh, as he deals with the therapy and the, and the treatment, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right, guys. Well, so it's always been, uh, it's always been sad if, if a preacher wants to get a good crowd at church. Uh, one of the things he can talk about is sex. If you talk about sex, you get a good crowd. Another topic is if you talk about the end times. If you talk about the end times, there's a good crowd. If you want a really big crowd, you want to talk about, are you going to have sex in the end times? <laughs> then you get a really big crowd. Um, so, so for the next few weeks, we're going to dive into a topic that, that, uh, that we don't really dive into. I, I, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's one that I have not, I have not <laughs> really studied until, uh, until these last few months. I started, this, started studying for this thing back in September. And I have read books and listened to podcasts and listened to sermons and read articles and, and, and talked to people. I mean, it, you could literally find thousands and thousands of resources on there. Some really good, some okay, and some pretty bad. Um, you know, you just have to, you know, like, you know, eat it just like you eat watermelon. You spit out the seeds. But, but there's so much stuff out there. And so what I'm going to try to do starting next week, I'm going to try to give you a list of resources and and try to bring in different things. If you want to borrow some, some of my books or anything that I have, you're more than welcome to. I really want to try to have a guest speaker at the end of this to try to wrap it all up. And there are a lot of people out there, a lot of Christian men and Christian women that are experts on this, a lot more expert, expertise than I have. And there's this, there's this one gentleman in town um, his name is Sam Alberry. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he is an he is an, an Anglican priest who is a single celibate homosexual. But he has said he said he's made this commitment that that he he is attracted to men, but that he knows that God does not want him to to act on that, and so he is he does not do that. He has chosen a single celibate life. He's written books. He's spoken a lot of places. His story is, is compelling. For anybody who struggles with that, his story is encouraging. That you can, you can overcome that sin, that struggle. You can make a commitment to God. He said that, uh, that, that he was... He was getting ready to go to college, and, 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 and he knew that he had this same-sex attraction. He wanted to go to college and explore this, this attraction that he had. And one of his friends invited him to church. So he went to church, went there a couple times, went there two, three times, four times, went on a retreat, came on Wednesday nights, and began to fall in love with God, gave his life to God, was baptized, and then he thought, well, now what am I supposed to do? I can't do what, I'm, what I want to do. I can't live out these desires. What do I do? And he chose to live a single celibate life. I think that's powerful. And you could talk about that with any sin. I think what happens a lot of times is we take that one sin and we make it greater than any other sin. If I'm a liar and I constantly lie, and I'm a deceitful person, at some point in my Christian walk and in my Christian life, I've got to say, I'm going to stop being a liar. That's not right. That's not godly. I've got to stop. Even if the temptation is there to lie and be deceitful, I have to stop. I have to stop being bitter 
or holding on to grudges or whatever. You could fill in the blank with whatever sin you want to fill it in. You have to make that conscious decision that I'm going to stop. So for the next few weeks, we are going to dive deep into the topic of sexual sin. To get there, we're going to do a, a short three-part series on, on the body. We're going to talk a little bit about the body and, and, and how the body, how God has given us a body, the, the things that we ought to do with our body, because really that comes down to it. And we're going to look at these, these three, uh, three topics of, of, uh, of it's my body, because a lot of people say, oh, it's my body, it's my choice, I can do what I ought to do, what I want to do. The God of our body, we're going to talk about that next week and how, how the patterns of this world come up and the, and the things that the world teaches us in contradiction with with Christianity, and we're also going to talk about, finally, how are, how are you supposed to be graceful and truthful at the same time with people? Now, that's hard. How are you supposed to be loving and kind and compassionate and Christian? But on the same hand, how can you also take those stands with people? How can you be graceful? How can you be truthful? Jesus did it perfectly. Once we get past that, we'll jump into this. And uh, we're going to talk about, and I know that first one's kind of funny, but, but you'll understand it when we get there. What is good sex? We're going to look at sex God's way, sexual brokenness. We're going to talk about gender identity sexual orientation, and then finally we'll close it up with pornography. Um, and after that, I think we're going to do a short series on healing. And I know you're probably saying, well, that's weird. That's weird. But it'll make sense once we talk about the body. All right? It'll make sense. But hey, let me tell you a story. I love a good story about a preacher. There's this old preacher, and he, uh, he got invited to go be a guest speaker at a conference. It's one of them real fancy conferences. And, uh, and they had a big dinner beforehand, and then he was going to get up and be the keynote speaker. And so he was getting his stuff together, and he was running late, running really late. He was in a hurry. He was behind the clock. He was like, man, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late. I cannot believe I'm going to miss this. So he pulls into this conference. I mean, barely on time. Shows up, and, and there's the dinner, and he sits at the, sits at the, the head table with, with people. And, uh, and he realized that he forgot his dentures. And he looked at the guy that was sitting next to him. He said, man, he said, I forgot my teeth. And that guy said, hey, don't worry about it. He reaches into his briefcase and pulls out a set of teeth. And the preacher pops them in his mouth and says, no, these are too loose. They're not going to work. And the guy says, oh, it's okay. I got another pair. And he reaches in his briefcase, pulls out another pair of dentures, pops them in. And the guy said, well, that's too tight. The guy says, hey, no problem. Reaches into a briefcase, pulls out a third set of false teeth, gives it to the guy. He pops it in. He said, wow, this is perfect. I can't believe this. So he went through the night uh, eating this meal, speaking, had a great time. And at the end of the event, the preacher said, you know, I need to go find this guy and thank him. So he looked through the crowd and he went to the fella. He said, hey, he said, I just want to thank you for coming to my rescue. Where is your office? I've been looking for a good dentist. And the guy says, I'm not a dentist. I'm the local funeral director. Um, hey, here's a fact for you. I don't know if you know this or not, and I know this might surprise you, but I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I'm getting older than I was. I'm older than I was. Um, I think the, that 50 is the new 40. Um, I'm not what I used to be, and neither are you. Neither is the person next to you. Go ahead and look at them. I mean, you can tell, like, boy, boy, they're really gotten old. I mean, I mean Kim, you had a birthday to, tonight. I mean, but 35, 35 does look good for you. Um, but I'm not what I used to be. Here are things that I've been noticing as I get older, that, that the world is too loud. I don't know if anybody else deals with that. The world is just too loud. It's just, it's just I like things quiet. I, I don't like the TV volume up. My boys get in their shower, and they crank up their music, and I'm thinking, why are you doing that? You know, I'm like, I, just, I go in the shower. I want it to be peaceful. You know, but they've got that thing cranked up listening to who knows what, Drake or, or the Leaves or whatever they're listening to. I don't know what they're listening to. Uh, I'm old enough now that I get excited about going to sleep. Anybody like that? I bet I can't wait to go to bed, you know. Uh, 
you know, like, man, it, it, gets, about, it gets about 8.30 or 9, and I'm thinking, man, you know, it's countdown time. Um, you know, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> yeah, I am old. I definitely old. And then what's interesting about, about going to bed, I'll go to bed, and, and I'll wake up in the morning, I've hurt myself. And I don't know what I've done. I haven't done anything that night. I just wake up, and I'm like, man, I, I, have, I have done something. Um, you know, it's just, just I, I, I injure myself. While I'm, a, while I'm sleeping. Um, it just happens a lot. Uh, but um, what's that, Betty? Yes. <laughs> listen, listen, that's a topic for another night. Um, so, so I want to talk about our bodies. Our bodies, called a temple for the Lord, right? You've heard that. This is, this is the, God's temple. I treat my body, and probably you do too, I treat my body like a storage unit, almost like a trash compactor. Um, fill it up with stuff that just isn't good, um, that, that, isn't, that isn't fulfilling, that's not healthy for my body. And so we want to talk about that tonight for the next couple of weeks, actually. We understand our bodies, what we're doing with them and what we're doing to them and why does it matter so much. And, and when we talk about our bodies, a lot of things come up about sickness and, and, and disease and healing and redemption of our bodies. We think about technology in our bodies. We, talk, we, th we even think about how sometimes, especially our kids, live disembodied lives through their technology, that they live in their own world and their own simulated world, their own video game world. And, you know, I'll watch my boys have these multiplayer games with this 2K, and they create their own player, and they're playing with people over in China and Russia and all these crazy things, and it's just a, just a, a, different, a different life. And so, so when we talk about bodies, it's a, it's a big topic to tackle. And for the next few weeks, especially when we get to the sexual part, there are going to be some things that we'll lean into and we'll be okay with. There will be some things that are going to make us nervous. There's probably going to be some things that will raise our blood pressure a little bit. But ultimately, through this series, we want to get closer to God. We want to learn how to love people around us. And ultimately, we want to honor God with our bodies. Have you ever thought about that? How can I honor God with my body? How do I do that? So tonight, instead of doing inspection where we look at people, we're going to do some introspection. A lot of times we'll, we'll sit through a sermon or a class and it's easy to think about the other person. Well, I wish so-and-so was here because they really need to hear this or or, 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 or I, I, they really need to pay attention to this. Well, I want you to try to resist that. And I want you to try to look deep down inside yourself. And think about your body. How can you honor God with your body? So let's start off with Jesus. Because Jesus honored God with his body. Hebrews chapter 10. This is an interesting passage. If you read this closely, this is Jesus talking before Jesus was born. Listen to what Jesus says. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, this is before he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. So Jesus gives us two facts about his own body. Number one, he says that there was a body that was prepared for him. That Jesus pre-existed his human body. That the Son took on the body that was prepared for him. Specifically. It says that there in the text. That God, you've prepared a body for me. Have you ever thought about your body being prepared for you? That God actually set, sets you apart, your own body. This is the body that he is going to, to bless you with. Now, none of us ever ask for the bodies that we have. This, this is what I was given, all right? This is what I got to deal with, believe it or not. Uh, and I'm supposed to be good to this. I'm supposed to be a steward to this. This body was, was prepared for me. But what about, what if something's 
wrong with my body? What if something is missing that other people have? What if you said this? And we'll get to this in a few weeks. What if you said this? This body that God gave me isn't the body that I want. Boy, it gets interesting because you're supposed to honor God with your body. A body was prepared for you. In fact, Psalm 139 says this, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I take for granted the body that I have from God. There is an OBGYN uh, that was talking about birth defects and, and, and difficult births, and, and, and he made this statement. He says, I know people ask why in those instances, and understandably so. I ask why are there so many babies born perfectly healthy because the more you understand how everything has to go right from conception to delivery, the more stunning it is that we have so many healthy babies. So the doctor says, it's amazing that, that, that we have so many healthy children. Not that, that there's this small percentage that, that seems to be something wrong. We should be thankful for our body. We should be thankful the way it operates, the, the way it should. If you're not thankful for your body, go talk to someone that has a feeding tube or is carrying around a colostomy bag or is dragging around an oxygen tank or someone who has been on a ventilator. We should be appreciating our bodies right now. What would happen if you were thankful to God? God, thank you for the body that you've given me. God, I want to honor you with my body. And we think about all those things that, 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 that happen, all those things that happen every single day that we take for granted, the fact that, that we can see and we can hear and we can taste and we can touch and, and, and that we can walk, walk and move. We, there's so many things that we can do, but yet we take it for granted. And, and, and we're going to talk a little bit after our sex class when it comes to healing because it's a good question. We pray for people, cancer and disabilities and different things, leukemia, does God hear those prayers? Does God move? Does God heal? Can we ask God specifically for healing? And if it doesn't come, what are we supposed to do when it doesn't come? What are we supposed to do when God doesn't fix it? What are we supposed to do when I'm not able to have a child or, or, or that my legs aren't walking, working the way they're supposed to do? So in the next few weeks after we get past these two series, we're going to talk about, about healing. But Jesus says that I had a body prepared for me. He also said this about his body. He said, here I am. It's written about me in a scroll. I've come to do your will, my God. We need to have the same mind over our bodies that Jesus did. He was humble and obedient to God, and so should we. He said, here I am. I've come to do your will, my God. If I was going to honor God with my body, say, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve? How do you want me to love? How do you want me to take care of this vessel? What do you, what, what can I put inside this body? What can I not put inside this body? And you might be saying, that it's too late. I've done some bad things with my body. I've run my mouth and I've hurt people. I've had sex outside of marriage. I've filled my body with drugs. I've had an abortion. I've cut myself. And there's so many other things when it comes to sins of the body. So many things that we take for granted that, that, that we physically do to ourselves. And Jesus says that he's come to do God's will. And, and in verse 10, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says this, And by that will, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So if you're thinking that it's too late for you, 
you need that verse. If there's someone in your life, a child, a spouse, a friend or something that has done some horrible things physically to their bodies or, on a, or, or is on a path that you think is, is not by Scripture and not godly, it's never too late. God can always work miracles. I think the church has gotten a really bad reputation when we've written people off. Amen? And boy, we've done that. We have done that so many times to so many people. We say you've done so much bad that you can't ever do anything good. Jesus says this, that we've been made holy through the sacrifice of his body. How he honored God through his body. Then in Galatians 3, it talks about our body once again. So in Christ Jesus, you were all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That you take your whole body and you immerse it into what he did with his body and you clothe them. That your entire body gets washed and covered and clothed with Jesus. And that's good news. But... Let's go visit a church that had some members and people there that were doing some awful things with their bodies. Now, this is in 1 Corinthians. This is about this particular church dealing with their body. Verse 9 of chapter 6. Or do you not know that all wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of her, that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now you're probably looking at the list saying, well, I'm not in that one. Um, read on. And this is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's a powerful verse because it says some interesting things. All of those sins that were mentioned are sins that are done in the body. All of these are done with our bodies. Here's the second thing that's interesting. You used to do those things. Paul's writing to the people at Corinth and he lists all these things. He says, these are the sins that you did in your body. Oh, and by the way, you used to do them. And here's the shocker. I don't know if you realize this or not. Those people are part of the church. Did you catch that? The people listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 had done all those things says that they were washed, they were sanctified, and they were justified. And they were part of the church. Would it shock you if we had people in our church struggling with some of those things? What do you think? Would it shock you? I don't think so. It wouldn't shock me. Do you think that we've, ha we've got some people in our church that used to do those things? I think so. I think so. The list is true for us. We still need to be washed and justified and forgiven and sanctified. But here's what's interesting about the rest of the story of Corinth. Those were the things that those people used to do. The problem was they were going back to them again. Why do you think people go back to those old sins? Anybody? Why do people return? Temptation. Yeah. Anything else? Because the temptation is there. It never goes away. If I'm a liar and I've given my life to God, I still got the temptation to lie. If I was a jerk, I still got the temptation to be a jerk. I, I just do. It doesn't go away. Satan doesn't say, "Woo, I'm going to leave Connie Joe alone, man. She's a baptized girl. 
No, Satan says, I know exactly what, what I can get Connie Joe on. You know, and it's just, it's just the way it is. Here's why I think these people went back to that. Because old, da- old habits die hard, don't they? You ever tried to lose weight? And you put back on the weight? Do you know the word habit actually means in your body that old habits really do die hard, that your body has to, has to relearn and unlearn things, and that discipleship isn't about perfection, it's about direction, that we're learning to walk in a different direction, that we're learning to walk differently, that, that we can't expect people to be perfect overnight, that if you baptize someone, that, that you think if you, they come out of those waters, you think they're going to be a perfect Christian? No, they're going to be imperfect. You know, people say that, we, that, that the church is full of hypocrites. They are. Where else are they going to go? Amen? Right? You know, or people say, say, you know, lost people shouldn't act like lost people. Well, why not? That's what they're supposed to do. You know? That's just the way life is. Old habits die hard. So why else were they going back? Now, I've got to be careful about saying this. Because I know we've all heard this from our kids, right? Everyone else is doing it. Have you ever heard that from your kids? Have your kids ever used that on you? Well, everyone else is doing it, Dad. Everyone else can do this. I've heard it a million times. I've said the same thing to my mom. Well, everybody else is doing it, Mom. Everybody else is, you know. And, 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 and we say, well, that's not right. Not everybody else is doing it. But... It sure does seem like it, doesn't it? I mean, when we're talking about sexual sin specifically, it seems like, to me, that everyone else is doing it. I mean, can you remember way back in the day when sexual sin innuendos and stuff that were mentioned on TV were really risque. Do you remember that? I'll, I'll never forget the, the, the TV show. And for those of you who are young, sorry about that. Uh, and I know, Kim, you're one of the young ones in the crowd. Um, you know, I remember the show Three's Company. Man, that was, a, that was a crazy show back in the day. Three's Company with Jack Tripper and, and the two girls, Janet and uh, Chrissy. All right, I knew, I knew there'd be a center in the crowd. Uh, but... Uh, but, but, you know, and I remember that show, I mean, it was risque. I had to sneak around and watch that show from, you know, I didn't want my mama to hear it. But, you know, now, today, today, is it like that? Is Three's Company risque today? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, today, it's almost expected that you're going to have, right? It just is. Because it seems like everyone else is doing it. Let me tell you about the church church at Corinth. Corinth was a wild place. Did you know they had the temple to Aphrodite there who was the goddess of love and she was worshipped by a thousand prostitutes? And that the males of the city of Corinth would come to the temple for male gratification? Can you imagine how packed that church would be? Um... You know, I mean, think about that. We've got a long-standing tradition of taking the word love and making it mean anything that we want. A thousand, I'm just going to say it like this, a thousand hookers gratifying Corinthian men in a church. And that's what the church at Corinth was dealing with. And it wasn't that they had been Christians for decades. They had been Christians for just a handful of years. They were young, baby Christians. The preacher at Corinth, I would imagine, would, be a, would have been a young, baby Christian himself. The elders would have been young Christian people. And they were dealing with this temptation that Corinth was also really close to Athens, which was the center of Greek philosophy. philosophy. And and, and the folks in Athens taught this. 
that the body, that the physical body was just a shell for the spirit and that you could do whatever you want to in your body and that gods wouldn't care what you do with your body as long as you took care of your, of your spirit. And that's why the Greeks had such a hard time with Jesus coming in the flesh because God in the flesh made no sense to them. Why would God send Jesus to be in the flesh that, that the matter and the flesh and the physical wasn't right, but it was only the spirit that mattered? The gods did not care what you did with your body as long as you paid homage to them. Imagine being a Christian in that kind of world that said you could do whatever you want to with your body. Could you imagine that? I bet you could, couldn't you? Doesn't that sound a little bit like the world that we live in today? That you do you and everything is fine. Paul needed to help that church out. Here are some mottos of that day that Paul had to deal with. See if, they, see if these strike a chord with you. Chapter 6, verse 12. I have the right to do anything. You say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Have you ever heard anybody say anything like that in our world today? I have the right to do anything. Paul is dealing with this in the church, not out in the world, this is what was going on in their church assemblies. People saying, I have the right to do anything. And the freedom of choice might be true. But you do not have the freedom to choose the consequences of your choice. Some things you choose might not have the benefits that you think that they would. And in the end, you become a slave to those things, right? And I think we all understand that, that we think I have the right to do anything. I can choose whatever I want to do. I can decide what's right and what's wrong and what's true and what's bad. I can decide that. But you don't have the ability to choose the consequences of those choices. You ever been mastered by something? I remember being young, I got mastered by this thing called debt. You ever been mastered by MasterCard? This was what Paul was dealing with. Not only was he dealing with, I have the right to do anything, he was also dealing with this. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The people in the church, the world of that day was saying this, that you feed your appetites, you, you, you get it if you can, your desires need to be satisfied, your feelings need to be fulfilled. All of that is happening today. Just do what you want to do. Make sure you're happy. Make sure you're fulfilled. The American way is to satisfy your inner, inner appetites. And this has been creeping into our society for years. For the last 250 years, we've been taught this in America. You just do you. Do whatever you want. You doing you is doing a lot of us in, isn't it? It's messed us up. It's causing some big problems in our world. And then it's odd that they put their food for the stomach and stomach for the food. Just do what you want to do. And then they put this in there. This, this is an odd little phrase. And God will destroy them both. The reason why they say that is because of the Greek philosophy that, that the physical world will be destroyed and it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh. They were attaching God's name to this. We do this today. We take what Jesus says and we filter it through our world. Do you know what the number one most popular teaching of Jesus is today in the world? Can you think? Don't judge. It's, his, it's the most popular thing that he said, and for the world, it's the only thing that he said. How many times has that been used? Do not judge. You shouldn't judge. It comes up all the time, and it's almost like that's the only thing that he ever taught. He never took a stand on anything else except... Do not judge. And people make Jesus into whatever they want and fit him in however they need to. Let's continue. 
By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Paul goes on and he says, listen, your body is going to be raised. It will make a difference. God is going to make a, a big time miracle in your, in your, in your self. In fact, they, he even talks about Jesus had a bodily resurrection that he left in his body. He'll return in his body. And Satan didn't even get the last word over Jesus' body. He won't get our get the last word over our body, that God creates the body. He sustains it. He washes it. He cleans it. He sanctifies it. He dwells in it. He redeems it. He will raise it. That your body matters. What you do with your body matters to God. Paul goes on in verse 15. It's interesting when you begin to look at, think about the word body, how much it pops up in Scripture. Just keeps popping up. Evidently, the body was important to God. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? This is an interesting part. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. You know, Paul is saying that you don't take what's supposed to be honorable to God and unite it with sin. Your body has a significance to him. He goes on in verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You were not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Remember the price that your body was bought for. That you shouldn't just do anything you want to with this. Your body was prepared for me. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We've got a lot to do in the next few weeks. Some things that we're going to jump into that's going to challenge us. So Peter gives us some encouragement. Once again, this word body comes up. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the overseers of your souls. That there's this encouragement that comes. That Jesus took his body, sacrificed his body for us. So I'll close with this. And I think this is something that that we need to think about and we need to think about with all of our friends and loved ones that are dealing with, with sin that's attacking us. When it comes to our bodies, we cannot go back and change how the story started. But we can start where we are and change how the story ends. We can't ever ever give up on somebody. Even if you look at that person and say they'll never change. Have you ever thought about that? I I've thought about that about people. They'll never change. I bet people, when I went to my six months of rehab, I bet there were people that said that about me. Well, David will never change. I'm thankful that there were people, especially my wife Susie, that believed in that statement. That you can change the end of your story. So I'll close with this, this, story, this last story. There was a small church in Indiana, and it was about, a, about 60, 70 people. It was a Sunday morning, and the preacher was up there preaching behind the pulpit, really giving it to them. And there was this man that walked in kind of late in the service, and he was, a, he was a, a big biker kind of fella. Had a leather jacket on, had some tattoos and some piercings, and he sat down like on the second row, and he was into worship. He was raising his hands, and he was participating, and, and the preacher loved seeing him there. And uh, <clears throat> service was over, and the preacher stood in the back, and, and up comes this biker fella. And uh, they shook hands and they talked. He said, uh, the biker guy says, hey, I want to show you some of my tattoos, some of my special tattoos. 
He rose up as slaves. And on his forearms are pictures of two women. And the biker said, these two women used to be naked. They had no clothes on at all. He said, but when I became a Christian, I went back to the tattoo shop and I told them to put clothes on these women. And he says, that was my start that I could change. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to tell people, even people that we are struggling with, that you can't change yesterday, but Jesus can take care of yesterday. That you start where you are, and the story can change. I think that we're a church like that. The question always comes up, at churches, what will we do if we ever have so-and-so come into our assembly? So what do you do? Can I ask you a question? What do you do if a sinner comes into the church? Welcome. In two weeks, we're going to try to figure out how we can be graceful and how we can be truthful. And I'll tell you this. I have fumbled the ball on that a lot. There have been a lot of times in my life that I've been really graceful to people. And then there's been times I've been really truthful with people. Jesus somehow was able to strike the perfect balance. Jesus could show grace to someone and in the same breath share truth. Somehow we've got to make sure we do that with people. In two weeks, we'll figure that out. I think Jesus has some, has some good hints and clues to help us out. But next week, if you'll come back, we're going to see how we got to where we are today. We're going to look a bit into our history and find out how did this world end up the way it is today. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and God, thank you for loving us and blessing us, Lord, and God, we want to honor you with our bodies. We want, to, we want to lift up our bodies to you, God. We want to be a living sacrifice to you, Father. We do not want to conform to this world. But God, we also want to be, we want to love sinners. We want to love people who are struggling. We want to love people who are dealing with, dealing with things that are just not of God, not of you, Father. God, help us to be a church. Help us to be people. We're both graceful and truthful at the same time. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you all for coming.